it is. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all of you for, for coming to listen to this talk about uh, the work that we recently put in the archive with Daniel and Anton. Um, the title of our work is called Topological Defects in a Quadruple Insulator Displaced Diverging Charge. So this is very much a spoiler of the talk that I will give today. But before that, I want to invite you to unmute yourselves or raise your hand if you have any questions. I prefer if you just unmute yourselves and, and interrupt me. So at the beginning of this work, we had, uh, we had one question, and that was uh, this one. Does a topological defect in the quadruple model have a one-half charge? I, I think it's okay if you're not familiar with some of these concepts, because today I will walk you through them and together we'll figure out the answer to this question. So let's start with the quadruple model. So here we see on the left, a tight binding lattice with four orbitals per unit cell. So the unit cell is a, is a square, like the, the unit that we see here at the corner. It has four orbitals, which are these gray dots, and they are connected via different hoppings. So for example, we have gamma x. Inside the unit cell um, along the x direction, we have lambda x connecting hoppings, uh, connecting orbitals between different unit cells. And we also have them along the y direction. So we have four parameters in total. Now, this model is unique because it does not have a dipole moment. Uh, it does not have a polarization in the unit cell, but it does have a finite quadruple model moment. Um, so it is unique, but it is also special because quadruple moments are not well defined so far and the community hasn't agreed on what, the, what this quantity actually is. So I will explain in a bit why this makes the model unique. But before I, I want to bring your attention to the fact that we have a couple of relevant symmetries here. Two of them are anti-commuting mirror symmetries. And this means that we can find a vertical line and a horizontal line such that the model is invariant if we reflect it um, with respect to these lines. So we can see here a um, vertical line, this is mirror X, and we can also see a horizontal line that uh, represents uh, or help us identify the mirror Y. And these two mirror symmetries are uh, anti-commute, and that is, uh, that is a relevant aspect of these symmetries, and we will also see later why. Um, and it also has some other symmetries, for example, sublattice symmetry. But this one is, is not so relevant for the uniqueness that I will tell you now. And so <laughs> the reason um, this is uh, important is because this model has quantized one half charges hosted at the corners when we uh, tune the parameters to be in the topological phase and for full symmetry is present. So for full symmetry means that we can take the lattice and rotate it by 90 degrees and, and get the same. And uh, when we do this, we'll see these uh, quantized, quantized fractional charges at the corners. So let's take a look first at the, at the topological phase. So here's, uh, here's the band structure uh, for different regimes uh, when C4 symmetry is present. Um, the fact that this is present means that uh, gamma along the x direction and the y direction are, are the same, and the same for the lambda. So, so we can identify two different regimes. The first one is the trivial phase, and that is when the hoppings inside the unit cell are larger than the hoppings that connect different unit cells. And the other one is the topological phase, which is the opposite condition. And in between, we have the phase transition. And we see that at the phase transition, the bulk gap closes at this one point in the Berlin zone. But in the trivial phase and in the topological phase, um, the band structure is gapped. So when I started working on this project and I was a, a master's student, I would look at these plots and wonder, well, how is this topological and how is this trivial? Both plots look the same, right? This, it, it almost looks like there's no difference. And so then later I learned that in order to tell the difference, we need to look at the open boundary conditions, for example. So these are uh, two different lattices in, in different regimes. Um, these are lattices of 20 by 20 unit cells. And what we see is that in the trivial phase, we do not have a mid gap mode. So there's, for example, no zero energy mode, and therefore we have no corner modes. Whereas in the topological phase, we see here 
four zero energy modes. And if we take these, um, the eigenvectors associated to these eigen, uh, zero eigenvalues and we plot them in the lattice, so we plot the local charge density, we will see that the charge is localized at the corners. So this is what makes the model unique, that we have charge localized at the corners, but not any charge. This charge is exactly quantized to one half. This means that the density of charge is decaying exponentially towards the bulk. Uh, well, in order to have this result, sublattice symmetry is not really important. So that's a symmetry that the model has, but we don't really care about. But the anti-commuting mirrors um, are an important component of the model in order to see this, this result. And um, another way to understand it is to look at the real space uh, representation. So to look at the tie banding model um, in a limit where uh, gamma is, for example, zero. So we have no hoppings inside the unit cell, but we do have uh, the hoppings that connect um, orbitals from different unit cells. So we have gamma equals zero, lambda equals to one. And we see that there are four isolated orbitals at the corners. Um, we have four orbitals per unit cell at a half filling condition. So uh, we have like two, two electrons available per unit cell. And this way we can understand that we will have these cornermost with a, a quantized one half charge. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, why is the charge one half? I never thought about it, but uh, why is it not one fourth? Ah, so um, uh, as I um, so we have four orbitals per unit cell, right? Um, and we have a half filling condition, which means that we have two electrons available, right? Uh, Yes, and then we have four corners and we have C4 symmetry. So the only way to distribute these charges would be to have uh, one half per corner. So this uh, usually depends on the, on, on, for example, if you have CN symmetry, the charge at each corner would depend on the symmetry that you have. So it depends on your lattice. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for asking. Um, so, so far I've been showing you the results for C4 symmetry. So we have gamma X equals to lambda ga uh, gamma Y and then the same with the gammas. But we can also explore the full phase diagram of the model. So before we were looking at the green line here um, and we saw that there was a bulk gap closing point when um, the gammas are the same and oh, here the lambdas are also one. So, so we have all the gammas and lambdas equal to one and the, well, the opposite condition. Uh, but if we explore the, the rest of the phase diagram, we see that the bulk remains gapped across it. So we only have four bulk gap closing points. And um, well, I just showed you that this model has a, like a bulk corner correspondence, but usually, um, for example, in standard topological insulators, we would expect something very similar happening with topological defects. So usually these, uh, the bulk boundary correspondence does not apply only to the, to the boundaries, but if we have topological defects, we, we can find similar phenomena. So by topological defects, I mean uh, defects like these. For example, in crystals, we can find uh, dislocations. Dislocation is a defect like this, where we have a series of, um, for example, atoms and then it abruptly changes and there are no atoms anymore. Oh, for example, a disclination where we take one uh, like atom out of the unit cell. And so we have a different unit cell that only has um, three sites. Um, or for example, in superconductors where we find vortices or anti-vortices. So these defects are called topological because in order to make the system defectless, so to take this defect away, we would need a global deformation um, and it cannot be just done by a smooth and, and local and local modification of the lattice. Um, Isidora, there is a mm -hmm. question in chat if it's possible to distinguish the phases by computing some sort of topological invariant. Um, in the model that I just showed? Yeah, right. It's still about ah. the previous slide. Ah, okay, so, um, so in that model, there is this uh, quadruple moment um, invariant 
but as as far as I um, as far as I know or, or understand, this cannot be calculated in the Berlin zone. So um, this is the quantity that people refer to in order to tell if there is a corner charges, if there are corner charges or not. Um, but it only applies when C four symmetry is present. Um, does that answer your question, Rodrigo? Yes. Okay. So. Okay, so I told you about the model. I also told you about these topological defects and how we can find similar uh, behavior happening with them. And so now we can move forward and understand the question better. So does a topological defect in the quadruple model have a one half charge? Well, it looks like it really should, right? So let's, let's make this defects and let's see what happens. So one way of doing one of these defects would be to take the phase diagram and uh, introduce, uh, introduce one using parameter space. So here there's something special and that is that we have one bulk gap closing point surrounded by space, uh, by space of Hamiltonians that are gapped. And so can we introduce a defect using parameter space? We can, and that's what we will do. We will introduce a parametric defect with our model. So to introduce a parametric defect, we, we fix a point in the lattice that we call the defect, okay? But there's nothing in this point. There's no extra anything. It's just a point of reference. And from there, we define a displacement vector R. And uh, what we do to introduce this defect is that, um, each hopping in the lattice will carry a different value depending on what the displacement vector R is for, for the line that we see as a hopping. And um, so what, what says here is that uh, we introduce position dependent hoppings, but the position dependence is not any. It has to parametrize a closed curve around the defect. Um, so it has to parametrize a closed curve in parameter space we're going to be using the phase diagram to introduce a defect in, in real space. And the way we will map um, parameter space with a real space lattice is by doing the following. So for example, here we see that the gammas in the X direction and the gammas in the Y direction are given as one plus a constant times a sine or a cosine. So these are projections of a, of a circle that has radius gamma R and a circle that is centered at one one. So let me let me show you this. So, so here we have both situations. We have the real space lattice and we have the phase diagram. And from the defect position, we find, for example, uh, this hopping and we identify vector R. We also have a vector R here. And so this is a gamma Y, sorry, a lambda Y. So this one will be one. But for example, um, a, a gamma, a hopping, so hopping inside the unit cell would be given by the X and, and Y projections of the curve that encloses a bulk gap closing point. So these are non-contractible loops uh, that enclose a bulk gap closing points. And um, that is how we are introducing the defects. So at this point, we say that we introduce a topological parametric defect that will trap a quantized fractional charge if the parameterization is a non-contractible loop in parameter space. So any curve that, um, that encloses a bulk gap closing point, uh, we expect it to lead to a quantized fractional charge. And, um, and with this, we make a hypothesis and we say that the trap charge will not be any charge. It will be exactly one half. Are there any questions at this point? No, okay. <laughs> so, well, why do we say that this charge will be one half, right? Okay, we are reminded of one half because we saw that a perfect square lattice with the corners would have a one half charge at each corner, but why do we expect to see one half here? So we have some intuition, but in order to, to understand better why the trap charge will be one half, we need to think of where the electrons are located. And, and we say, or yeah, we say 
that the charges are located at the veneer center's positions. Um, so the veneer centers are the expectation value of the, of the position operator of a, um, of a band. So we're looking at bands in real space. It's like we're thinking of where the electrons are located and where exactly they are will depend on the parameters that we are choosing. So for example, in the trivial phase, um, we, we will see that the electrons are located at the center of the unit cell. And in the topological phase, the electrons are located at the edge of, uh, of the unit cell. And um, thinking about where the electrons are located has been used before. So for example, there's this uh, recent paper um, in which uh, called trapped fractional charges at bulk defects in topological insulators, where by introducing a disclination and thinking about the, the veneer centers, um, these disclinations were uh, proposed to trap these quantized fractional charges. Um, and their respective modes were observed in myth materials. So using veneer centers um, is, an, is a method um, that has been used to, to argue about these uh, fractional charges. And so we will, we will do something similar with, uh, with our defect. So we see in this section of the phase diagram, the trivial phase. And in the trivial phase, we can say that um, we have two electrons both of them located at the center of the unit cell. And, um, and this we can understand, for example, thinking about the anatomic limits where there's no reason for the electrons to, to leave the atoms. Then we have in this region here, the topological phase. And the topological phase is distinguished because uh, here the veneer centers, the electrons are located at the edges of the unit cell. So each of these Blue circles is, uh, are two electrons um, located at the edge of these uh, unit cells. And this can also be understood by thinking, for example, of the SSH chain or the Kidaev chain, where we have um, these uh, edge modes. But then we still have the rest of the phase diagram, right? Because the parametric defect is a circle around this point. And to, to understand these other two uh, representations that are, that are drawn here, um, we can we, we need to think about how the symmetries of the lattice affect the positions that the electrons can take. So let's take a look at only two unit cells. We know that we have sim uh, mirror symmetries and the electrons must respect these symmetries. So here there's a mirror Y and there's mirror X for each unit cell. So we start, for example, in the trivial phase by having two electrons at the center. And one possible way to move them that respects the symmetry would be to do the following. So we take two electrons and we, by changing a little bit the, the parameters, the gammas, um, gamma x, gamma y, we, for example, move them uh, in opposite directions, but as long as they respect the symmetry, they, they are fine. And so now we change the parameters a little bit more and they move a little bit more and then for example, they could also follow this path. And as long as they respect the symmetries, the, the veneer representation is, is fine. And so by, by thinking of the symmetries in the lattice and how they restrain the veneer centers, we can see that in, these, in this region, we expect to see the veneer centers uh, in between unit cells, um, like in the, in the middle of the, of the edge. And in the other region, we expect um, the, the, op the opposite one, right? So they have done different paths depending on which parameters they are. And so if we put everything together by looking at the uh, circular parameterization around the bell gap closing point, we see that if we try to merge everything together, there's something missing here. So here we, we just paste everything together. And so, we say that the defect is expected to be topological, which means that a quantized fractional charge will be trapped here if a non-contractible loop is parameterized. So if we are enclosing these, uh, this yellow point here, if we're choosing a different curve and we're not enclosing this point, then we expect to see no charge trapped. 
and, and we can see here how, how there's a, like a different density of these points. Uh, I see Juan has a question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, in the slide where you were moving the, the veneer centers, mm -hmm. where you showed that they, they must always respect the symmetry. Yeah, exactly. In that one, in the next, uh, like if you just do a mirror symmetry along the center of the axis, you will change the position of the two in the in the extremes. I, I don't see what what's the symmetry in this one because like the what. Oh, the you veneer mean like? Do you mean like this? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um. Oh, but we're, we're talking about the box. So there should be another unit cell here and another one here. And if you think about having infinitely many, then um, the mirror symmetry will be respected in the bulk, right? Okay, okay. thanks. So um, yeah, so, so that's the idea. We have to think of um, having infinitely many. And so if there's another one here, um, yeah, there, there will be, uh, they will be respected. Um, so at this point, to argue about the defect, uh, the, topo the topology of the defect, we have only used the, the mirror symmetries that need to be locally preserved. So one, one other way of thinking about this parametric defect is by um, looking at the metamorphosis too uh, by Escher. Um, we can see here this, uh, um, and that we can we can start here, for example, moving uh, in this direction. Everything changes, of course. Like we're going through completely different patterns. But at each point, if we were there, we would see around us and we would say, "Oh, there is a structure, and everything is fine." And then we move a little bit. It's very it's very smooth, very small. We we see around us, and everything is fine. There's always a structure, but but the whole structure changes, right? Like these. Of if we jump from here to here, there's a different pattern, but everything is smoothly deformed and the structure, and by that I mean the local symmetries are preserved. Um, so this is uh, another way of uh, looking at the parametric defect as we go around the, the circular path. So uh, with this, I've, I've told you about the parametric defect and now we can proceed to make the defect. So here on the left, there is a circular parameterization around this bulk gap closing point. And on the right, there is the real space lattice that, uh, that contains that parameterization. And the darker colors represent, uh, show the strong bonds in relation to, to the weak ones uh, nearby. So for example, this region here is associated to this region here. So this is a trivial phase, and we can see how the bonds are stronger inside the unit cell um, and not uh, outside. And in this region here, we can see how the, the bonds get stronger between unit cells and not inside of, of them, because uh, that is the, the topological region. But everything is changing smoothly around this area here that, that contains the defect. So we make a defect like this, and. And now we can study the defect charge, which is uh, what we're looking after. So we make the defect, and now we can compute the charge density. And so the charge density, we define it as follows. So uh, there's rho, the charge density, that has two index, and those uh, label the different uh, unit cells in the lattice. And we're considering the wave function's amplitude for all the orbitals, so the four orbitals in the unit cell, up until the Fermi level. Right, so we are working with a half filling condition, and um, and this is what we see. So we see a distribution of charge at the defect, which is great. But then this is not enough. We need to understand. Um, we, we need to figure out if the charge is actually quantized, and for that we we calculate it by integrating um, different regions around the uh, the defect and uh, subtracting the two electrons per unit cell that we know that each unit cell is contributing. So we're looking here at, at uh, rho ij minus two. This is what this plot is showing. So we're excessive of density. And uh, so in the first plot here, um, we see the charge convergence. In the second one, we will, uh, we will see how, how it converges. And the third one is again, uh, the local charge density. So to get this plot, we, as I said before, I, we integrate uh, around the defect. 
um, different uh, different areas. So for this area, for example, we see a, a total charge integrated in it. Um, then we integrate a bigger square and we see more charge. But at some point, we see that the total charge around the defect stabilizes and it stabilizes at 0 0.5. So this is exactly what we were looking after. There is a quantized one half charge located at the parametric defect, but not only that, it converges exponentially. And that is what the second plot here shows. So we see that the logarithm of the difference between two consecutive points is, uh, is a line. And so that means that the defect charge is converging exponentially. So, okay, with these results, we are really happy. Um, the hypothesis seems to be correct. Um, but now we start wondering if the charge was really quantized. So the model has, a, has, um, has different aspects, right? And I told you that it has these mirror symmetries that are very important uh, because those are the ones that give us the corner charges. But it also had some symmetries that were not relevant to the problem. And uh, one of them is, for example, sublattice symmetry. And sublattice symmetry is known because it protects charge quantization. So actually, the one half defect charge that is so nicely quantized is not a result of the model that we're looking at, but a result of sublattice symmetry. And to study the properties of the defect, we have to break it. And we do so by adding extra hoppings that, that break it. And um, well, after we thought about this, we, um, we added uh, hoppings between different unit cells, but between the same sublattice uh, to break sublattice symmetry. And we observe a, a charge density distribution like the one here on the left. So we see two colors and one of them, so blue one is a negative um, uh, charge with respect to the two electrons uh, per unit cell. The red one is excessive charge. Um, and this distribution is like, it looks like a quadruple. Um, and what happens is that if we, if we start integrating the defect charge around, um, around this point, uh, we see that the, the charge does not converge to 0 0.5, but it converges to some other number, right? It looks like it converges to 0 0.49 or something, which, uh, which is really weird because why would something be quantized to 0 0.49 and, and, and some other values? So, so how do we know if the charge is quantized? Well, usually when we think about quantization, we also think, well, we have to think about convergence, right? We are reaching a value and that's a value that cannot change. And so to integrate this charge so far, we were integrating the charge density, but there are two different ways in which we can do this. One of them is proper convergence, which is uh, the absolute convergence, right? We integrate the absolute value of the charge density. And if this integral is finite for, um, for R going to infinity, then we can say that we have convergence. But if we have a situation like in the second one, so we have uh, the integ integral of the charge density of finite for R going to infinity, well, this is conditional convergence and they are two completely different things. So for example, we can have conditional convergence without having absolute convergence. And to, th to see this, we can think of having infinite ones and infinite minus ones. And so I could come here and add one plus uh, minus one, it gives me zero and I keep adding them in pairs and I can say, oh, this, this converges to zero. But somebody else could say, oh, I will count the box of ones first and then the box of minus ones. And, and well, if they are infinite, you will never stop counting and you will see that there's, there's actually a divergence. And so what we see is that conditional convergence without absolute convergence means that the charge diverges. So we need to start counting this way. We need to start looking for absolute convergence. And when we, when we do that, um, we realize that the charge 
around the defect is not quantized to one half anymore. Um, so this one we have labeled with Q, uh, not with uh, uh, the total charge. This is an absolute uh, excessive charge. Um, and this curve is actually described by a logarithm and the charge is indefinite. So does a topological defect in the quadruple model have a one half charge? Well, a parametric defect has an infinite charge. So we constructed a defect following this procedure using uh, real space symmetries, expecting to have a quantized charge. We saw that uh, with sublattice symmetry, we have a quantized charge, but it's actually the effect of the lattice symmetry and not of the model. So then we went, we broke it, and we see that uh, we have an infinite charge. But what happens with other defects? I showed before um, the disclination defect also having trapped uh, fractional quantized charges. So, so what we do now is so we take a look at a disclination defect as well. And to do that, we take a lattice, we cut one quarter out, we glue things back, and we assemble, um, we assemble it back again. So, so again, we're taking the, the squared lattice. Like before, we take um, a quarter of the unit cells out of them, then we, we glue them back again. And uh, well, of course, to make it, um, to make it all uh, like a distillation defect, we need to move the the unit cells such that it looks uh, like this. But this also introduces strain in the lattice because if we go far away from, from the center, we will see that even though the mirror symmetries are locally preserved, like in the Escher's uh, painting, even though the mirror symmetries are locally preserved, we cannot uh, restore a square unit cell back again. So there's necessarily strain in the lattice. And that is something that we, we also consider. And of course, we add, uh, we break sublattice symmetry by adding um, extra hoppings as well. So again, here, we expected to see a quantized one half charge because we have a unit cell with uh, three orbitals, which I have feeling contributes 1.5 electrons. So we have here a one half excess, another one half here, another one half here, and the fourth one here. So everything adds up. And uh, what we see after breaking sublattice symmetry and after including strain is that again, the defect charge diverges. So here um, we see in dashed lines, the cases for which we have sublattice symmetry. And in those cases, we see that the total charge is one half. And then we have in solid lines, uh, the cases for which we broke sublattice symmetry with a, with a hopping delta. And in those, uh, the total charge is again, getting to this uh, 0 0.49 value. And if we study quantization, um, like absolute convergence, how it should be, we see that with sublattice symmetry, we have perfectly quantized charge, but without it, Again, the defect charge is diverging. And so, so we can conclude that the defect charge is quantized to one half only when there is a lattice symmetry. The third plot here shows us that the, with sublattice symmetry, the defect charge is converging exponentially. And the fourth one shows that the, without sublattice symmetry, so with these solid lines, um, indicate that one over the difference of, um, of charge uh, goes, uh, grows linearly with the, uh, the size of the integrated region. So this tells us uh, how the density of charge evolves, um, which, which in the end leads to having a divergent defect charge. But well, so far I've showed these results for specific values, right? And these are uh, numerical simulations. So we need to, we need to make sure uh, whether this charge divergence is a universal phenomena or, or not. And here is where the last part of, uh, of our argument comes, and that's uh, the scaling arguments. Uh, so we consider the, the strain in the lattice and um, 
the strain in the lattice as a with a perturbation theory approach. And so we see that the ch ch changes in the charge density can be captured by perturbation theory. And so we consider a perturbation like the one that, that is uh, written here. So H prime is the perturbation to our um, uh, Hamiltonian of, of the defect. And um, this perturbation has different terms. So it has terms that are independent of position. It has this is a zeroth order term. It has terms that vary linearly with position, quadratically, and those are the terms that we consider. Um, and it's of course uh, Hermitian. And the, the, the basis for considering this is that, well, first we saw this relation here. So we know that the charge density goes like one over R squared. So this kind of perturbation uh, is enough. Also, we, we know that the Hamiltonian is gapped. Therefore, local, the local charge density is only affected by local perturbations. And we know that these, uh, and we consider that these uh, uh, four um, like Hamiltonians or like H prime zero, H prime one and H prime two are mirror symmetric. So, so we're describing a perturbation that goes with delta R. So it goes with the distance uh, from the defect. And uh, what we see is that if we calculate the, the change in the charge density that this perturbation produces, uh, that is one over R squared. And that is because even though even each of these Hamiltonians is mirror symmetric, the fact that this one only has a, a single delta R means that this one is uh, odd under mirror symmetry. And so only, only second order terms um, of this Hamiltonian survive and then first order terms of this one. And so in the end, we, we can conclude that the difference in the charge density um, goes like one over R squared, reproducing what we saw numerically. So, uh, so we see that the charge divergence is universal if sublattice symmetry is broken. So uh, finally, we, we can answer the, the question that we started with. Does a topological defect in the quadruple model have a one half charge? Uh, no, it has an infinite charge. And uh, with this, uh, you, you can start asking your questions. Uh, hey, Isadora, can I ask a question? Sorry. Uh, so first of all, thanks for the awesome talk. Um, I have a question at the beginning when you were explaining, um, uh, when you were giving a figure of this, uh, this space of Hamiltonians uh, with respect to the parameter gamma X and gamma Y. Um, um, do you know which slide? Or uh, do you mean this? Or? Oh no no it's uh, it's the one where you had the you know the uh, the bulk gap uh, closing points. Um, this one? No, the other. Uh, I, think oh, the I see this one. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So I was um, interested because here this I guess this plot describes the space of all kind of translationally invariant uh, Hamiltonians that you have you can construct with these gamma y and gamma x. Um, mm -hmm. But I was a bit confused as to how you kind of introduce your defect, um, but then map it to this space because your defect obviously makes it so that your Hamiltonian isn't translation invariant anymore, but you still somehow map it as a kind of like a circle you, you showed here back to mm -hmm. this plot. So I'm wondering you know, what does it mean and, 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 and why can you do that, I guess? Um, why can I do what exactly? Uh, like why I can make this lattice? It, well, or can you go maybe go a bit uh, ahead um, with your slides? Yeah, so here, so I'm, I'm more interested about these loops. Um, how can you like map these loops back to this plot here where this kind of loop, um, I guess, corresponds to a non-translationally invariant Hamiltonian because introduced the defect, mm -hmm. but this whole kind of space is of a translationally invariant Hamiltonian. So I'm, I'm just confused. What does it even mean to have this loop here, I guess? 
Mm. So, um, okay, so the your first question, why can we do it? Um, I'm not sure how to <laughs> how to answer. So, um, so we we make this map intentionally, right? And you can you can just modify each entry on your Hamiltonian according to a function that you define, and that sh that should be okay. But um, why we can um, we can continue using the parameter space? Uh, well, that is because if you go very very far away from the defect. And your parameterization is uh, changing smoothly and slowly. Um, you can continue to think of of the bulk in the vicinity of the points of uh, oh. where you are. Okay, right? so, so it's like locally kind of uh, translationally symmetric. I guess I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, if you go so, slowly, I guess. so the yeah, yeah so. Um, yeah, so there's no translational invariance in the mm -hmm. in the defect, yeah. right? But uh, we can still be very, very, very far away from it, um, and we're only well, well, we preserve the relevant uh, symmetries, and we're varying things very uh, slowly. So mm -hmm. you can continue to think of of the properties of of the bulk. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Right. That answers my question. Thank you. Because even if, for example, even if it wasn't a loop and it was just you're just changing parameters around here, it would be fine, right? Mm -hmm. If you, if you were changing, yeah, I, I, I see your point about local uh, changes uh, continuously. Uh, that answers my question. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, if I may, I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm just so you you when you're talking about an infinite charge, you mean that when you take the magnitude and then integrate, that's the infinite, right? I get that correctly, right? Yes. Yes. So we think about uh, like uh, inf infinitely growing lattices. So. Right. So if I but like for instance, if I think about a just like normal like you know some sort of an insulator, you know, like and if mm -hmm. I have like electric field, I polarize a little bit. Now if I look at the charge density and integrate, it's probably that will also be divergent, right? With the same um I'm sorry, I lost you for a second. I was um right. so if I if I suppose I take you know salt or something like that, some sort of you know, like some sort of a, you know, some insulator. I apply electric field, so I polarize a little bit, or, or you know, like I mean, I just just generate some polarization in the lattice, even even a neutral, completely neutral mm -hmm. lattice. Now, if I integrate it your way, take the magnitude of the charge density and then integrate it, then I will get something divergent. Mm. Well, that... as long as I think as long as the system is finite, the ish, there should be finite charge. Right, um, but I mean, according to like you know your definition, this will this will tell you that. There's an enormous amount of charge being, um, like, let's say, something that scales with the bulk or something. I, I mean, just just trying to understand. Yeah. The, yeah the so what we're saying, yeah, yeah. So what we're saying is that uh, it's not decaying exponentially, and it's decaying like a power law. So um, the the way that it grows with the size of the system, uh, yeah, it does not converge because it doesn't decay exponentially. It decays as a as a one over r squared power. So if That's you, for instance, coarse grain or something like that, that wouldn't actually solve it, that, that growth. Oh, uh, no, no. Okay, that's, I think that, that is the point, I guess, is that Anton is saying, okay, so I'll speak. Okay. All right, great, thank you. I see also a okay. question in chat uh, uh, about the, the absolute value of rho. Uh, so, like, uh, if you have an electron in the hole, uh, so this is this is about the uh, the absolute convergence slide, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read the question, but I don't. Uh... Um... Oh. oh, this one. So the question is: In a pictorial view, if you have an electron in a hole in a box, would you say you have a? Um... So we are, 
Um, I'm not sure I, underst I understand the question. So, uh, so may, we have, mm -hmm, yeah. May I uh, give an attempt at answer? Uh, so the reason why, uh, why absolute convergence is important is because with conditional convergence, you, all, you can always rearrange how you compute the charge to come to an absolutely any answer. Like if you, if instead of squares, you would take circles, you would, ha you would have a different answer. If you would shift the squares a little bit to the side, you would get, have a different answer. So basically any kind of uh, charge, which uh, any kind of integral that doesn't converge, absolutely doesn't have a well-defined uh, quantity. This is why, why it's really important that uh, the absolute convergence is preserved. But indeed, if there was, if there was a, a single unit, a single unit cell with a charge minus one and one with plus one, this would, this would, uh, the absolute deviation would be charged two e. As, as you said, does this help? Yes, it seems to help. Yes. So uh, I do have another question. Uh, thanks for our talk, by the way. Um, so is there a, a, a so I imagine uh, I understand this is like a, to the extension of SSH. Um, is there like an, an analogous version of the Kitaev chain uh, for this? So, so it's more like a, a lack of my knowledge in the, in this like high order stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and if so, what what this uh, result would mean in a superconducting system, like this this infinite charge? Uh, in a defect. So I think I have seen preference with uh, like the BBH model or the quadruple model and also with super superconducting uh, terms, um, but I am not sure. So I have, <laughs> I have Sorry. never tried that. Um, but there you have uh, the particle hole symmetry, right? And um, I guess I'm not sure, but maybe that that works like the sublattice symmetry that you also uh, get quantization as a result from that, um, because your spectrum will, will will be symmetric. So I think the argument would be very similar. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. But I, I have no idea to be honest. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway, thanks. Because the. The idea, um, so the argument that we use to say that uh, sublattice symmetry is what causes quantization is that you can you can divide the contribution from the um, positive energy states and negative energy states and 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 uh, the contribution is the same because of sublattice symmetry and I, I think particle hole would have the same implication. Yeah, I guess I'm not sure as well. But yeah, anyway, thank you. I have a question. Uh, well, mm -hmm. first of all, it was a very nice talk. And I might have missed that before, but uh, there was a question about like topological invariant, if you could see this in a topological invariant picture. So I'm wondering about the, the last plot that you show, where you show that, for example, the charge is not quantized. I, I mm -hmm. wonder if this same plot could be seen like from a topological invariant perspective where you could see a difference in the two systems. Um, what When you say the last plot, you mean this this whole plot or do you I mean? mean the two, I mean the two systems that uh, have uh, the, that have like different properties, right? In one, the mm -hmm. charge is quantized and in the other one not. So I wonder if those two systems have like different topological invariants. So the thing is like, if you had a topological invariant, the charge should be quantized. Um, Right, because I mean that's what we're uh, people are looking after this topological invariant that leads to this bulk corner correspondence. So if you had a topological invariant, you should see quantization of charge, and if you don't see it, then um, then I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, following that question, what what controls that in this plot is basically delta, right? 
because um yeah yeah so delta is the is the hopping that breaks the sublattice symmetry so if there will be a topological invariant you would change it by tuning delta in this case um no so the thing is that when delta is, is zero you have sublattice symmetry and then the topological invariant that you can define is a um i think like a winding number but uh, if you break supplied symmetry, then we, we don't see this quantization. So um, a topological invariant should cause like would consider the the eigenvectors um, in like uh, of the Bloch Hamiltonian, but not whether delta is one value or another. Okay. okay. Do you want to say something, Daniel? I see you need to. Oh yeah, I just wanted to add that. Uh, I mean, there may still be some topological invariant for this. Um, it just might not come with a kind of bulk boundary, bulk uh, defect correspondence. And uh, also, I, I wanted to comment. There was a question earlier in your talk uh, whether there is an invariant for the C4 symmetric case. Mm -hmm. And there you can uh, look at uh, these um, symmetry representation. Uh, invariants in the brillant zone with the C4 symmetry. And if I remember correctly, the, the two faces with C4 symmetry are distinguished by those. There is no uh, um, integral expression, right? You mean? Uh, not, not that I know of. No, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Mert, you, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Thank you for the nice talk, first of all. Uh, I do have a question about the, the shape of the boundary. I mean, what happens if I, of course, you're uh, having, I mean, you have um, four orbitals per unit cell, and then, of course, the, this is not a continuous model, but what happens if you try to make a like a circular shape? Uh, the so how would, for how the, would the charges model? localized there? You mean for the defect or the original model? Uh, both, let's say. Um, since you said, you said. <laughs> since I'm offering both. Of yeah, this, yeah, if you're offering. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, so, well, I I tried the original model with the circular shape and. Uh, I mean, uh, naively, you would uh, you think that it has a continuous rotational invariance, yeah, right? Yeah, but it doesn't. Yeah. A circle, but it doesn't because the unit cell is squared. So you see the modes localized at where the lattice intersects with the border of the mm -hmm. circle. But of of course, it's also not a not a perfect circle. Um, and then in the defect, you also see defect charge mm -hmm. uh, located at the defect. So it does not depend on the on the boundary that you choose. I have one naive question, but maybe this is already in the in the presentation. But let's yeah. go back to the original model, and then I cut a hole in the in the lattice, so that mm -hmm. it's still like C four symmetric. Still, mm -hmm. uh, the mirror symmetry is anti commute. Let's mm -hmm. say, but uh, then what would happen? But now you have you have eight corners. Mm -hmm. So what would happen then? Uh, you have eight corners. Um, like you well, cut, I would a, you expect cut a to square see one hole in each. the middle. You just I make the first. To, I would expect to see one half of each. Hmm. Um, okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Because you Thank can. You. So to see that, you can use uh, also this this picture. Mm, okay. Yeah. So if you make a hole, um, you. You would see, so yeah, so we nothing, can, we can actually draw nothing it, but you would. Hmm? So you would still have uh, one over two charges at the outer boundaries for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then. Uh, so they all should add, should add to a multiple of two. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? No. 
No? Okay. Then I think with this we can finish the presentation. Thank you very much for the nice presentation.